Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, April 11th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today, of course, was Microsoft's Patch Tuesdays. Overall, kind of an average Patch Tuesday. Nothing really overly critical here. We have patches for a total of 66 different vulnerabilities. Microsoft characterized 24 of these vulnerabilities as critical. Now, there are a couple sort of vulnerabilities that are a little bit more interesting. First one that I actually sort of missed initially is an information disclosure vulnerability in Outlook. Now, usually information disclosure vulnerabilities aren't really all that interesting, but there's an interesting blog post that goes into detail how to exploit this vulnerability, which the root cause here is that Outlook will actually load remote content from SMB file shares. And it does so in the Outlook preview pane, so you don't actually have to fully open the message. Patching will prevent Outlook from actually connecting to the remote share. One vulnerability was known publicly before this month's patches. It's a cross-site scripting vulnerability in SharePoint. Now we had many vulnerabilities like this before. According to Microsoft, it's unlikely that we'll see an exploit for this vulnerability. So we'll see what's happening here. And then we do have a denial of service vulnerability in HTTP.sys. That's actually the part of Microsoft's web server that sort of deals with the HTTP protocol. This vulnerability does affect the HTTP2 implementations. Now, HTTP2 is still a bit new at this point, And I think this is about the time now where you should expect researchers to probe this protocol in more detail. And with that, we will probably see various vulnerabilities like this in different implementations. And then we have two additional denial of service vulnerabilities in network services, RDP and SNMP, the simple network management protocol. Of course, neither should be exposed to the outside world, but we all know they often are. Adobe also fixed six vulnerabilities in Flash Player. So like I said, overall, your average patch Tuesday, nothing really to get too excited about. Just test your patches and apply them carefully. And then we got an interesting weakness in how iOS does control access to your contacts. As an app is installed on your iOS device, it may request access to your contacts. Now, often uh, this sort of implies that the application would like to read your contacts. However, iOS doesn't actually distinguish between read and write access. So any application that's able to read your contacts is also able to modify them. This can then be used for interesting social engineering attacks because Messenger is identifying the name of a particular user contacting you based on contact information. So the attacker could add an additional phone number to a trusted contact. And now whenever you do receive a message from this additional phone number, it will show up as a message from this trusted contact. Of course, overall, the risk here is just the same as a spoofed caller ID. According to the blog, Android may have the same problem, but the author didn't actually test it with Android. Now, the next story, I wasn't really sure if I should include it because I think it is somewhat overhyped by the vendor that released it, but it's still sort of an interesting vulnerability, even though I don't think it's really all that terribly new. It does affect public warning sirens. Now, you may have heard about some vulnerabilities here before. In the past, we had, for example, some actual attacks that usually were not triggered by weakness in the actual siren system, but instead just by compromising the PC that controlled these sirens. This attack uh, does actually rely on a weakness in the wireless protocol being used to control the sirens. 
And that weakness is pretty straightforward. The commands are sent to sirens via RF signals without any encryption. So an attacker really just has to figure out what the right frequency is, record some of the signals being sent during, for example, test alarms, and is then able to just replay the signal in order to trigger an alarm. Now, of course, to trigger the signal, you need a radio that actually is able to send the signal, not just receive the signal. You may have seen these very cheap software-defined radios that only receive. In this case, you will need a little handheld radio that is connected to a computer to send the signal, but apparently you can buy one for $30. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.